What's up? Let's continue the anatomy of the central nervous system. In this segment, we will cover the complete anatomy of the medulla oblongata. So remember, the central nervous system consists of two parts, the encephalon and the spinal cord. The encephalon is further subdivided into specific parts. We have the brainstem, which consists of the medulla, pons, and the midbrain, or the mesencephalon. We have the cerebellum back here, then the diencephalon and the telencephalon. So our focus in this video is going to be the medulla oblongata, which is here. So in this video, we're first going to cover the external surfaces of the medulla, basically look at its topography and what structures you'll find from an anterior view and a posterior view. And then we're going to slice up the medulla to look at the internal surface, basically see how the gray matter and the white matter are arranged within it. And at the end of this video, you'll find a quiz which you'll hopefully be able to pass based on this video. All right, so we can start by replacing this picture with a more realistic one. The medulla is here, lying above the spinal cord and below the pons. The medulla also connects with the cerebellum, so you will find the cerebellum behind the superior part of the medulla oblongata. And all of these structures lie within our cranial cavity, within the skull. So topographically, the medulla starts at the level of the foramen magnum, which is uh, the distinct border between the spinal cord and the medulla. And in the front, the medulla lies in clevis, which, remember, is the anterior portion of the occipital bone. The length of the medulla oblongata is about 2.5 centimeters, so it's a quite small portion of the brain, but a very important one. Now, externally, your medulla has two surfaces. It has an anterior surface and a posterior surface. Let's now cover the typical morphology of these two surfaces, starting with the anterior surface first. So if you look at the brainstem from this perspective, you will see this. And again, the medulla oblongata is here in green. So there are five grooves that you can see on the anterior surface. The first one is the anterior median fissure. Then laterally to that, you can see the right and the left anterior lateral sulci. And then laterally to that again, you will see the right and the left posterior lateral sulci. And notice between these grooves, there are bumps that are very characteristic for the medulla. And the first bumps are called the pyramids of the medulla oblongata. And they're located medially between the anterior median fissure and the right and the left anterior lateral sulci. The pyramids contain the corticospinal tract, which comes from the pyramidal cells of the primary motor cortex, which remember is responsible for voluntary movements of our skeletal muscles. Now, a majority of these fibers from the corticospinal tracts will decussate at the lower border, forming the decussation of pyramids. And we will talk more about that when we talk about the internal surface of the medulla. I just mention it now to give you something to remember the pyramids with. All right. Now, laterally to the pyramids, you will find the olives of the medulla, which contains the olivary nucleus. So these are the bumps. But there are some cranial nerves that go out from the medulla through these grooves. We have 12 cranial nerves in our body, and each serves its particular function for the brain. But from the anterior part of the medulla, you will see the 12th cranial nerve, the hypoglossal nerve, going out from the anterior lateral sulci. The 12th cranial nerve is responsible for the movement of uh, most of the muscles in the tongue. So this nerve goes out from the anterior lateral sulci and then goes to the tongue. So that is that. Then on the posterior lateral sulci, there are three cranial nerves that go out. These are the cranial nerves number 9, number 10, and number 11. The glossopharyngeus, vagus, and the accessorius. Glossopharyngeus is mainly for coordinating the swallowing process and is also responsible for the gag reflex. Vagus goes to most organs in your body and regulate their function, mainly parasympathetic fibers. And then the last, accessorius, is an accessory nerve for the neck muscles. So that is the anterior view. Now, let's turn the picture around and look at the posterior view. So the posterior part of the medulla is highlighted here in green. And if you now remove the cerebellum, you will be able to see the rest of the medulla. Now, the upper part of the medulla oblongata takes part in forming the so-called rhomboid fossa, which is a fossa that contains many nuclei. That means that the lower part of the rhomboid fossa is considered a part of the medulla oblongata. But we will cover the rhomboid fossa briefly in a separate video to really focus on the anatomy of the medulla for now. So, on the posterior surface, you will find the posterior median sulcus. On either side of the posterior median sulcus, you will find the gratiole fascicle. Remember we talked about this one when we talked about the spinal cord? 
The grass cell fascicle receives sensory input from the lower part of the body and sends it up through the spinal cord and then through the medulla to the gracile nuclei, which form the gracile tubercle. Laterally to the gracile fascicle is the cuneate fascicle, which receives input from the upper part of the body and the cuneate nuclei will form the cuneate tubercle, just like the gracile tubercle. From the posterior surface of the medulla, you will also be able to see the inferior cerebellar peduncles, which are fibers that go within the medulla to the cerebellum, as you see here. So the inferior cerebellar peduncles connect the cerebellum and the medulla together. So that was all for the external surface of the medulla. Now let's go ahead and cover the internal surface of the medulla oblongata. The internal surface of the medulla consists of two parts. There's the gray matter and there's the white matter. And just to remind you again that gray matter always contains cell bodies. And when we talk about gray matter, we're talking about nuclei. White matter always contains fibers and which form tracts. Now, let's finally take the medulla and give it a good slice to focus on the internal surface. In theory, if you want to go deep within the neurology of it, the internal surface of the medulla differs along the superior part and the inferior part of it. Meaning if you cut the medulla at different regions, you will find different structures. But in this video, I'll just slice at the superior part of the medulla and talk about the most significant parts of the internal surface while highlighting which parts belong to which levels so that it gets easier to understand the medulla oblongata. So here is the general outline of the medulla. We will be able to see the anterior median fissure, the pyramids of the medulla and the olives, and posteriorly, we will be able to see the gracile tubercle and the cuneate tubercle. And then on the sides here, we can see the inferior cerebellar peduncles, which remember connects the cerebellum with the medulla. So I hope you're following so far. Let's now go ahead and fill up the internal surface with structures, starting with the gray matter. We're first going to have the gracile nucleus, medially, with the gracile tubercle. Then laterally to that, we have the cuneate nuclei within the cuneate tubercle. Within the olives, we have the olivary nuclei. And then in the middle, we'll have the reticular formation, which is a network of gray matter throughout the brainstem. And I'll show you this in a little more detail later. Then lastly, you'll find many nuclei of the cranial nerves within the medulla at the region of the rhomboid fossa. And you will find the cranial nerves number 8 to 12 there. And again, these are not significant for the understanding of the medulla anatomy for now. So I'll mention these in the video about the rhomboid fossa. So these are the gray matter of the medulla oblongata. Let's now see how these nuclei are associated with the tracts within your brainstem by looking at the white matter of the medulla. While talking about the tracts, I will represent the blue color as ascending tracts or sensory tracts, and the red color will represent the motor tracts or descending tracts. All right, so first off, we will start with the fibers associated with the nucleus gracilis, and we will add the spinal cord to visualize this one. Fibers that synapse with the nucleus gracilis are sensory fibers that come from the lower parts of the body through the spinal cord. These fibers will then ascend and synapse with the nucleus gracilis in the medulla. I use the letter G in gracile nucleus as genitals to remember that the nucleus gracilis receives input from the lower parts of the body. And it receives conscious epicritic sensibility, which is conscious proprioception. Remember, this is kinesia, joint position, and the sense of force. But it also receives input from the mechanoreceptors, which is responsible for two-point discrimination, meaning the minimal distance between two points required for you to detect it as two points and not one. So if these two pencils were very close to each other, you would have detected that prick as one point and not two. So two-point discrimination is your ability to discriminate between these two points, meaning the minimal distance needed for you to sense those pencils as two points, not one. It also receives input like vibration and touch. All of these are sent to the nucleus gracilis. The cuneate nucleus receives input from the upper part of the body through the cuneate nucleus, which also senses epicritic sensibility. All right, now from the gracile nucleus and the cuneate nucleus, where do the fibers go? Well, they split into two pathways. They split into fibers that go through the inferior cerebellar peduncles, as you see here, as fibers called the external arcuate fibers. And remember, since they go through the inferior cerebellar peduncles, they're going to the cerebellum. Now, since we have an external arcuate fibers, we will also have internal arcuate fibers. 
and these fibers will cross over to the other side, as you see here, and these are called the internal arcuate fibers. And since they both cross to the other side, they will decussate to form the decussation of the lemonisci. And they're called that because once they cross, they will start to ascend upwards in your central nervous system as the medial lemniscus to go further through the diencephalon and then to your primary somatosensory area and your cerebral cortex. Next, we have two tracts on either side called the spinocerebellar tracts. Remember we talked about those when we talked about the spinal cord? We have the anterior spinocerebellar tract and the posterior spinocerebellar tracts. Remember, if the tracts end with the word cerebellum, that means that these tracts will ascend to the cerebellum. But the way these two tracts do that is a little bit different. The posterior spinocerebellar tracts are closest to the inferior cerebellar peduncles. So it will go through this inferior cerebellar peduncles to the cerebellum. The anterior spinocerebellar tract will ascend through the medulla oblongata, through the pons, and then to the midbrain. From the midbrain, it will go to the cerebellum through the superior cerebellar peduncles. And since these tracts go to the cerebellum, that means that they're responsible for unconscious proprioception, like giving information about the poster and joints. Now we have two other ascending tracts here as well, called the spinothalamic tracts. We have an anterior spinothalamic tract and the lateral spinothalamic tract. These tracts are going to go to the primary somatosensory area in your cortex, and as they ascend, they get the name the spinal lemniscus. And since they go to the cerebral cortex, that means that they provide conscious sensory information. And that is for pain and temperature and pressure and touch. So that was all the ascending tracts I wanted to mention in the medulla. Now let's do the descending tracts. And the first one is the one that's the most significant of them, located within the pyramids of the medulla, called the corticospinal tract. These fibers will originate from the pyramidal cells of the primary motor cortex, and then they will descend. 80% of the fibers that descend will cross at the medulla oblongata region, like this, and form the decussation of pyramids. After they cross, they will descend as the lateral corticospinal tract. The remaining 20% will descend as the anterior corticospinal tract, and only decussate at the region they exit at the spinal cord. And since they come from the pyramidal cells of the primary motor cortex, that means that they are responsible for voluntary movements of the skeletal muscles. Next, there are the corticonuclear tracts, which descend at the same area as the corticospinal tract, and the corticonuclear tract are responsible for voluntary control of muscles located in the head and neck. The next descending tract is the vestibulospinal tract. Inside of your ear, the inner ear, we have a system called the vestibular system. The vestibular system has crystals within it sensing the position of your head, whether the head is tilted upside down or to the side. All of that is sensed and through the vestibular nerve, it's sent to the brainstem and then down to your spinal cord to keep your balance and posture. So the vestibulospinal tract is responsible for keeping your balance and posture. And this happens unconsciously because this tract doesn't originate from the cortex. So unconscious balance of your body is the function of this tract. So that is the vestibulospinal tract. Next we have the olivospinal tract, which comes from the olivary nuclei. The olivospinal tract will also take part in helping you keep your balance and posture. Now through the olivary nuclei, there are also fibers that go into the cerebellum, called the olivocerebellar tract, which aid in your balance system as well. So that's these. Next we have the rubrospinal tract. Rubro means red, and the reason why they are called the rubrospinal tract is because we have red nuclei located inside the midbrain of your brainstem. So these fibers are extrapyramidal because they are not originating from the primary motor cortex, they come from the red nuclei of the midbrain, and they descend as the rubrospinal tract. And remember, extrapyramidal fibers are responsible for fine coordination of movements and support voluntary movements. So they make your voluntary movements more precise. So that is the rubrospinal tract. The next tract is the tectospinal tract. It transmits motor impulses for the eyes and neck muscles. So they coordinate the eyes and the neck muscles when you look at something. Imagine you're looking at a hamburger. You're looking at it and you keep looking at it as it passes you and your neck muscles follow your eyes. 
That's what the tectospinal tract is responsible for. It's called tectospinal tract because it comes from the tectum of the midbrain. Uh, it's located on the posterior surface of the midbrain. And notice that this one's also extrapyramidal, so it unconsciously moves your neck muscles with your eyes. Then we have the reticulospinal tract. We have the lateral reticulospinal tract and the medial reticulospinal tract, which are also a part of the balance and poster system. They come from the reticular formation inside of your brainstem, and the reticular system are responsible for the sleep and alertness and cardiovascular control and breathing and all of those vital things, but they're also responsible for motor control like your balance and poster through the reticular spinal tract. So that is all of these. Let's now just clean up the labels and add a little color to differentiate them. There is one more tract that we need to mention, which is called the medial longitudinal fascicle, which descend and is present only in the cervical segments of the spinal cord. This one will coordinate the involuntary movements of the head and neck and eyes through synapse between the cranial nerves number 3, 4, 6 and 11. So that was all I had for the white matter and the gray matter of the medulla. I made this table for the nuclei of the gray matter and the tracts in the white matter we just went through, along with a little description of them. Now, this is where this video gets scary. I am going to make all of these names disappear, and can you, from the beginning, tell me what is the name of number 3? What is the name of number 4? Where does number 6 go and where does number 11 go? If you can do that, then you've grasped the anatomy of the middle of Lingata fully. If you found this video helpful, please put a like, share, comment, whatever you find convenient to you. The next video is going to be about the pons.